this edition of Mac Voices is supported by Zapier. Connect your apps and automate your workflows. Zapier is the easiest way to automate your work. For a 14-day free trial before the end of this month, visit zapier.com slash macvoices. Mac Voices is supported by LinkedIn Jobs. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. Pay what you want and get $50 off your first job post at linkedin.com slash macvoices. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, just a relatively short time ago, Apple announced its uh, quarterly results, and once again, yawn, we had another record quarter. We know this can't keep up, but it's awfully nice when it does. And I wanted to talk about that and a few other financial-related things, and that means that we had to have Mr. Mark Fuccio back because he's the guy that has all the financial knowledge. Mark, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Hi, Chuck. Uh, thanks for the invitation uh, to be here and you know share some of our conversation with your listeners. I think we have a good topic for today. I, I definitely do, and I'm just sorry we couldn't make it a little bit sooner, but I was traveling for work, and we just couldn't put our schedules together, and so here we are, though, and, and we're going to get to it. Um, as I said in the, in the intro, you know, Apple once again had a record quarter. Um, it seems like all of a sudden all the iPhone – controversy has disappeared. Um, services seem to be doing well. Apple Watch seems to be doing well in the wearables category. Uh, it just seemed like there was a lot of lot of good news here. Yes, that is true. Um, in terms of you know their reported results, you know, they had a great quarter. It was the holiday quarter, so that uh, always you know towers over you know, the other quarters throughout the year. But it does set, in many ways, sort of a new you know, new base from which you know, other growth occurs. Um, but Apple being Apple, you know, there's always news stories and, you know, new today, you know, there's a uh, you know, talk out there about, gee, you know, it looks like maybe Apple's you know, subscription and take rate on uh, Apple TV plus is only 10%. And, you know, how could that be? And that's really horrible. And, you know, there's um, you know, new, uh, the end coronavirus is shutting down all of Apple Japan and, you know, the sky may fall, you know, for that. So, um, it's just a typical, you know, bull versus bear you know, battle that uh, goes on. You know, it wouldn't bother me so much if at times it didn't feel like it's a bit contrived. And Jeff Gammon was here a couple shows ago, and we talked a little bit about it. But once again, you know, the coronavirus, I mean, look, it's a, it's a legitimate thing. There's no question. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about that as we go. But as you said, the Apple TV uh, take um, percentage, you know, it just seems like, to balance any good news, they always have to try to find some bad news. And that's not taking anything away from the quote-unquote bad news or the good news, but it just seems like they can never report kind of the, the facts and just leave everything else alone. They have to find something. Um, I'm thinking about that. And there's Maybe there's two ideas there. One is uh, reporting of facts, and then the other is you know, maybe the way it's conveyed or – putting some sort of spin or you know, overarching interpretation. Um, which one of those would you like to dig in first? I take, take your shot. I mean, whatever, because I've, I've expressed my opinion plenty of times, and I think I just did again, you know, that I just find it, I, I find it frustrating. It's, it's like someone who does a product review that if, if there's a, an honest to God, deficit of, of some kind in the product, absolutely. That has a place. But if, if the product is a really good product, then point out the high spots. If there's a problem, spot point it out. But you know, if if just because the you know the the casing is colored blue and you don't like blue, that's not a legitimate thing. And that sometimes is the way it feels to me when we get Apple reporting. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think there's there's a lot of that. I, you know, certainly, um, whenever I see a headline that Apple must, you know, I just just ignore it. You know. I write it off as clickbait and as, you know, somebody's, uh, you know, stinky opinion. You know, and uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the media, you know, have uh, quotas and columns that they just, you know, they have to, they have to fill. Um, it was interesting, you know, you know one day last week, uh, you know, I think it was the day after the Apple report, um, somebody had you know, put out there, you know, a tweet with, you know, positive and a negative uh, coverage from 
I think Wall Street Journal and Financial Times. <laughs> and I tweeted out, oh, this is a classic bulls versus bears, you know, you know, battle in Wall Street. And I was surprised. I got a message back from him saying, oh, but this is journalism. They shouldn't be that way. And, you know, I thought about that. And it, it really seems to me that um, it, since, you know, since journalism is so much in the battle for attention and you know, trying to get attention as measured by a click, you're not going to have really neutral or um, just purely factual, you know, headlines. And I think that's just a fact of life. And um, maybe, maybe, we're, you know, some of us are a little oversensitive to it in the, in the sphere of Apple, but, you know, I dare say it's a similar, similar thing for, you know, other companies. It's just that people may not be, you know, as tuned into it. You know, certainly Tesla has had its shares of, you know, lovers and haters out there. So, um, I think that's just uh, unfortunately an artifact of the media and how it works and how they have to uh, write headlines in order to try to drive a click. Yeah, you make boy, that's you know you make some really good points there, and and I admit that you know we are definitely tuned into it. And I love to use this example that you know if if you have a local news story that you know something about. The number of times that you see it in in the paper or you know on TV or whatever, and they get it not not slanted, they just get something completely wrong, mm-hmm. and you know it, and it seems like you know it's something fairly significant. Then you take that and and figure, okay, so if they got that wrong, and I know something about that, why am I taking them at their word for all these other things? You know, shouldn't I apply maybe that same skepticism to everything else? And and that's kind of where I've gotten to. Um, the other, the other thing, I don't know about you, but I use, um, I, I use Feedly to subscribe to a bunch of RSS feeds mm-hmm. and it's, it's always interesting the day of, or the day after a, an Apple announcement, uh, where they will, if you scroll through all the coverages and all the headlines, how different websites will both Apple and, and mainstream, more mainstream news will, will char- characterize the results you know, some will gush, some will find some little thing to complain about and, you know, and couch it as negative. And it's just so difficult to find that nice balance. This is what happened. This, they, they beat these expectations and, you know, maybe why or why not or what the factors were. But yeah, it, it your point about it driving, trying to drive clicks is a great one. Yeah. So let's talk about Apple and their results. Go for it. It seems that uh, you know, they're you know, firing on, as they say, you know, they're firing on the proverbial all cylinders. Um, you know, Apple Apple phone, you know, revenue was up. You know, they saw a rebirth of uh, growth in uh, the China region, so that was good. Um, I think they you know commented that the iPhone 11 was the most popular phone every week throughout the season. So you know that's good from a shareholder perspective because. That's a relatively high price, it's a high margin uh, device. Uh, against that, uh, you know, services was up, and uh, you know, they got a lot of uh, kudos for that. Um, Macs and iPads were down a little bit uh, year over year, and uh, either Tim or Luca point out in the call that uh, that was because you know they were kind of saying, "Well, that's an unfair comparison because last year you know we introduced new products, so it drove a lot of new sales." To which I would say, duh, you know, why didn't you introduce new <laughs> products this year? <laughs> so, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, overall things are doing very well. And then, you know, the uh, you know, the wearables category just absolutely exploded. And that's the category that, you know, covers, you know, the, uh, you know, the you know, ear pods and, uh, you know, the watch, you know, as well as, um, you know, other, other devices like the HomePod, you know, which, you know, it continues to sell, but, you know, at uh, really unknown you know, volume levels. Um, but, um, you know, overall it seemed, uh, you know, it was a you know, really good, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good results. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're now, I guess, several quarters past the time when Apple said we're no longer going to break out home pods, watches, AirPods, yeah. you know, all those kind of things. And the more, the more I look at it, the more I think that was really smart because otherwise you just open yourselves up for all this intense scrutiny of each product line and sometimes, you know, I, maybe unfair scrutiny. Um, you know, Apple can decide whether a product is successful or not, whether they're going to continue it or what tweaks need to be made. Um, so, 
I'm I'm kind of happy with that that they they don't break it down. I know a lot of people are not. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, to me, looking at um, you know, their financials over the past couple quarters, yeah, everybody's wow. The Apple share price has doubled, you know, over the year, um, and you know, part of that is you know their you know, their PE you know ratio has expanded, and that's driven in part by I think you know a lot of uh, the institutions becoming a little bit more comfortable with understanding what Apple is doing, and to that, looking at you know their different streams of revenue as, you know, revenue from Macs or iPads or services. Uh, I think by having the bigger bucket of accumulation, you know, it facilitates looking at what's going on with the business rather than people getting lost and going down the rat hole of, you know, this number of units of this or this number of units of that other device. Um, So, you know, I think really, it seems to me from a you know Wall Street and investor perspective that um, you know over the past year you know services have continued to grow uh, you know and you know people are starting to realize that you know Apple is a multifaceted uh, machine uh, and they've diversified you know away from you know their almost extreme dependence on iPhone for source of uh, revenue and profits. So uh, I think you know as a result of you know that better uh, understanding. You know, it's gotten rewarded with uh, an expanding you know, PE multiple. I think it's now around 20, 21, 22, um, which is more common with you know a lot of you know high tech stocks. Whereas if you dial back, you know, two years, it was stuck down in the twelve or fourteen level, which is more like an oil company or a tobacco company or something like that. You know, basically, you know, Wall Street saying you know we don't we don't understand it, we can't value it, so we're going to put a low multiple on it. Mark, with the with the possible exception of the HomePod, I don't remember seeing any articles, and I mean any articles, um, that scream that Apple needs to lower its prices. And that's something that for a while, it's you know, Wall Street seemed to advocate. You know that race to the bottom. Well, if Apple could just drop their prices on this, and I, I'm not even sure I've seen that really on on the iPhone uh, price comments. Um, it seems like yeah, they some some folks feel the HomePod may be a little bit overpriced, um, but other than that, has Wall Street finally gotten over that uh, that race to the bottom mentality? Oh, I I don't know if I would be so bold as to say that. I mean, it's it seems to me a number of these themes. There's you know, there's only a finite number that you can uh, you know, focus on at any one time. And you know, there's many more, <laughs> many more Apple ghosts out there. So you know they're in the closet and they'll come out. You know if Apple has a if Apple has a weak quarter, we'll be hearing. I'm sure you know their prices are too damn high. They need to lower them. Uh, but you know for the short term, I think you know that that is packed away in silent uh, in the closet, waiting to uh, to escape. Yeah. Well, at the moment, and you alluded to it earlier, the coronavirus issue is is a, a huge thing because not a – well, I guess I'm hearing it mainly as Apple is being required or is shuttering some of its stores in China right now during this outbreak. And so far, I haven't heard a lot about it affecting the manufacturing processes long term. Uh, maybe just a few little rumblings, but nothing quite that dire, but – you know, you have to make it, you have to wonder. And as we record this, um, for the last two days, Apple, well, yesterday, I guess Apple took a pretty big hit or Friday, Friday, Apple took a pretty big hit, um, in its price. Mm -hmm. And today it sort of stabilized with just a, a, an incremental or, uh, yeah, it was down a little bit, but not, not yeah, a very little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I, is that being overplayed? You think? I, and I know I'm, I'm asking you to comment on coronavirus, but are the concerns overplayed? Um, I don't know. It all depends on you know, what happens. What's the severity of this outbreak? You know, is it? Because uh, you know, right now, you know, everyone is focusing. It seems on uh, the rate of spread of you know cases, but I don't think we know enough yet in terms of you know lethality. Um, and you know, just how deadly it is. So until we understand more about you know, the basic you know, biology and characteristics of, uh, uh, of the uh, virus and the disease it causes, um, I think you know, people are running hot and cold. You know, we saw it last week. One day we saw, Monday we saw a collapse, and then we saw a little bit of a recovery. So um, 
you know, that's, uh, I think, an involving real-time situation. Um, if I was uh, yesterday at a Super Bowl party, you know, so, uh, you know, you know, you know, a friend of mine and he runs uh, manufacturing operations for, you know, a company here in the Valley. And um, he, you know, he opened and he, he had his, uh, he had his phone out and it had a, uh, you know, sort of reporting dashboard. And I recognized some of the numbers, you know, 17,200 and something as coronavirus, but I just, you know, start with conversation, asked him, Bob, what is that? And, you know, he told me it's uh, information, you know, gathered and I guess published by, uh, I think he said CDC. Um, and, you know, it was tracking uh, the virus. I said, you know, I asked him, I said, have much impact on your business? And he said, yes and no. He said, you know, they, they have a manufacturing facility in, in China um, as well as Singapore. And they're transferring as much as they can from China to Singapore uh, you know, to just try to eliminate all the uncertainty over SARS because um, they don't know. He said, you know, they're, they're extending, they're following suit like everybody, extending the Lunar New Year holiday from uh, the 3rd today, you know, to, to the 10th, you know, a week from today before they reopen. Um, that's if they reopen. We'll have to see what happens uh, with news later on this week. Uh, so net result of this is, you know, it seems that, you know, all sorts of companies are just trying to you know, understand tactically what is the situation on the ground. And, um, you know, certainly if people aren't working and they're not, uh, you know, uh, assembling and producing, uh, you know, that can create, uh, you know, just product shortfalls. Um, you know, I think, you know, there is a you know, gap, you know, geographically between Wuhan where the virus uh, was centered, you know, versus, you know, some of the, uh, the coastal cities where, you know, uh, a lot of the contract manufacturing plants, uh, Foxconn, you know, you know, et cetera, are located, but, um, still it's, uh, it's, it's an evolving unknown situation. So going back to your original question, um, you know, it's, you know, how bad is bad, you know, and it's just, you know, what do you fear? It could be 1%, it could be 10%. It could be a hell of a lot worse. We just, just don't know. Yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> At the end of last week, I was in in Las Vegas for a conference, and they were saying, you know, th that every store, you know, had sold out of the masks. Mm -hmm. um, you know that, that anybody coming from China, going to China or whatever, w w they were walking around Vegas wearing masks. And in the in, you know, in the very next news story, you know, they have a doctor on there saying, "Look, the masks don't really make a difference." Um, so you know, you you wonder about you know the power of the media and you know to disperse good solid information at a time it's really needed. I mean, the World Health Organization made some announcements and, you know, when, when, when they show up or the CDC announces something, you got to take it pretty seriously because now with, with plane travel, the way it is, if there is an outbreak, it can spread so fast, so much faster than they can control it. Um, so you really do have to pay attention. But I also, wonder about, you know, the, the, the more calm reporting of that kind of thing so that there aren't panics, um, but there is an appropriate level of response. Right. I've noticed uh, over the past day or two, uh, you know, a number of the uh, news uh, stories seem to contrast, you know, SARS cases against flu, where we have 15 million flu cases this year. So, you know, I think, you know, uh, the end corona, you know, virus is, is the new shiny object, you know, in, uh, in the public, you know, health sphere for everybody to focus on, but you know, against that, you know, it's more important you know, here in the U.S. that people get you know their flu shots you know, to protect them against uh, you know, flu because you know that is as many times. I mean, it's you know m measured in tens of millions of uh, you know uh, people who have the virus versus seventy five thousand known at this time for you know, for the uh, end coronavirus. So. Um, again, I think it's a little bit of the news and just the nature of the news cycle, um, uh, you know, distorting, uh, perspective on things and what people should be doing. I mean, you know, forget about masks, wash your hands all the time and get a flu shot. You know, that's, you know, that'll protect you against both flu and cold. Um, you know, quick plug, if anyone here is interested in learning more about, um, you know, the, you know the, the new coronavirus, um, great podcast called This Week in Virology. 
And last week and this week episodes, you know, they've been talking about, uh, you know, the coronavirus and the evolving situation, you know, in China. And if you're interested in some of the biology and medicine, you know, medical aspects of the virus, you know, it's a great podcast uh, that you should tune into and listen to. I specifically wanted to ask you about the, the the virus impact because I know that that whole virology thing is something that you're into. I mean, folks, this is the only man who ever picked um, <laughs> pill- pillows that are made are, are are representations of bacteria and viruses as part of our gift guide. So you that's know, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Doctor Fuccio. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to welcome another new sponsor to Mac Voices this week, Zapier. Growing a business is hard, especially when you're wasting hours every day moving data from emails to spreadsheets to your CRM to wherever. Shouldn't that kind of stuff just happen without you lifting a finger? Zapier can help. Zapier is the easiest way to automate your work. We talk a lot about automation here on Mac Voices, and you won't find an easier way to do it than Zapier. No more trying to figure out what app to use to automate a task. Zapier can handle it. I built my first Zapier automation by clicking and selecting from menus, and I didn't write a lick of code. It was easy. It didn't take five minutes. And best of all, it worked. My first automation was a task between Facebook and Gmail, but it could have been anything. You might want to instantly engage with leads, send them to a CRM or a spreadsheet, then notify your team so that they can act fast on every opportunity. Whatever your need, Zapier can handle it. They support more than 1,500 business applications, so the possibilities are virtually endless, and it's almost guaranteed that they support what you already use. Join the more than 4.5 million people who are saving an average of 40 hours each month by using Zapier. Right now, through the end of the month, try Zapier free by going to our special link, zapier.com slash macvoices. That's Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash Mac Voices for your 14-day free trial. Zapier dot com slash Mac Voices. Thanks to Zapier for being a sponsor of Mac Voices. Mark, though, we wanted to zoom back out a little bit to more of a 10,000-foot level and talk about the, I, I think we were referring to it as the Trillion Dollar Company Club. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, that, that Apple got there first, but there were others that, you know, have have followed suit, have kind of bounced in and out of the club. Apple's bounced in and out of the club a couple times. Um, you know, what does what does this mean? I guess in the grand scheme of things, is it just that wealth and power and and uh, and technology are are centered in these companies, or is it a, a sign of things to come? Is it good for the economy, for business, for innovation, or is it not? Oh wow, Chuck! That's a whole lot of questions all at once. So let's let's try to take them one by one, if if if, if we can. So I, I think you know, to the first question, I think what it means is that um, you know there. Are, so just for you know listeners, the the trillion dollar club is is Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, and Amazon's bouncing in and out uh, based on uh, fluctuations in its share price. Um, you know what I think it means is that you know these companies have products that address you know tremendously large markets around the world, you know U.S., you know Asia, Europe, Middle East, South America, Central America, you know even the scientists and down on uh, Antarctica, you know <laughs> need you know can use these services. So I, I think the fact that you know they're so large is in part a reflection that uh, they serve very very large markets. Uh, and they're able to do it, you know, profitably. And, you know, that's sort of, you know, a ding on, you know, some of the failed, you know, you know, stupid IPOs of, you know, last year, you know, Lyft, you know, or um, uh, Uber, or the, you know, or just a totally embarrassing failed IPO of WeWork, you know, just junk companies, no profits, trying to go public, you know. So um, the trillion dollar club companies are there because they actually are selling and servicing customers and, you know, making profits as a result. Um, yeah, it, if you look at them, you know, I think there is some a little bit of mild competition between them, but I think they're very much, you know, seem to be, you know, their core is focused in uh, different areas. Um, 
you know, Apple is fundamentally about, you know, making devices with screens and selling it to us, you know, with, you know, other related things like speakers or services around, around the core. Uh, Google is all about, you know, serving up advertising. Um, Amazon wants to sell you stuff. And Microsoft is uh, software and software-based uh, cloud services. Um, where they seem to be, uh, you know, competing is, you know, obviously, you know, the Google, the Android phone you know, is a you know, competitor against, uh, you know, Apple's uh, iPhone. Um, then there is uh, you know, competition with uh, between Apple and Amazon for in the smart speaker space, uh, as well as in some of the uh, music and uh, video delivery spaces as well. And it strikes me that with the exception of Microsoft, all the others have some component of entertainment that they're, they're, you know, to to varying degrees and varying angles. But of course, Amazon has Amazon prime. Google has Google play. Apple has, has um, Apple TV plus um, arcade. And now they're getting into original video productions. Amazon is doing that as well. Um, I, I find it interesting that Microsoft is, is not, I mean, they're not competing in the phone market. They are not competing. I mean, Cortana is there, but it seems to be sort of there and nobody talks about it, never hear about it. I don't know anyone that uses it. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that's pretty much it. Um, Microsoft claims to be a whole lot more business oriented and a lot more cloud services oriented. And yet, I'm sure you saw it. You know, they've been doing now these advertisements for their Teams product, which is a competitor to Slack. And today, Teams was down for about six hours because somebody forgot to renew a security certificate. <laughs> not good, guys. Not good. Yes. So, uh, well, Microsoft just you know completely failed on mobile, uh, and you know one aspect of mobile devices is entertainment. You know, so I mean, they just completely failed and. You know, I think Satya Nadella, you know, was sort of the custodian, just, uh, you know, swept all this stuff out and put in the trash can and enabled Microsoft as a company to uh, move beyond it. Um, what's interesting, uh, you know, to me is, uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, Google, um, you have, uh, when you said, you know, entertainment, I was immediately thinking of YouTube. I wasn't thinking of some of their subscription services. Um because certainly, you know, they monetize, uh, you know, the hell out of uh, everything that uh, they show on uh, on YouTube. Uh, if you know anything is seemingly popular, you know, you have, you know, it may be a fifteen minute segment, and if it's very very popular, you may have five or six ads, you know, interspersed, you know, through it. So um, you know, Google again, you know, as they do with ad, you know, serving on top of you know indexing other content. I think they found a way to be a free rider, to, you know, to <laughs> extract, you know, advertising revenue on the backs of, you know, other people's uh, content. Amazon to me is, you know, much more interesting because, you know, in their earnings report last week, I believe they announced they had, they announced their number, I believe it was 55 million, uh, you know, music subscribers. And when you dig in, you know, it's hard to f- figure out exactly what that means because, uh, there are some levels, you know, if you have a prime service, uh, you right away, you get to conveyed rights to use, uh, you know, to have some of the Amazon music. Then they have some various levels of tiered uh, playing, uh, you know, or tiered services that you pay for. Um, and I must admit, I haven't been able to really persevere to, you know, you know dig through you know, to try to figure out ultimately, you know, how many paid users they have out of that 55 million. So, um, you know, as as our friend Ken Ray says on his podcast, when it comes to Amazon, it's uh, fun with numbers without numbers. So they have 55 million users, but uh, are they Spotify users? By which I mean, you know, freeloaders who are you know not paying anything, and uh, you know they are only monetized at very low you know ad uh, you know display ad uh, rates. You know, or are they like uh, Apple users? You know, where they're actually you know, paying. Uh, you know, 10 bucks a month, you know, for uh, use of the service. Uh, that part, we really don't know. Yeah, the, the Amazon service, I mean, I do not pay for the Amazon service. I do pay for the Apple service. Uh, the Amazon service is, I find it frustrating because if I ask my, my uh, Amazon device to play 
something from artist X, then what it does is it may find a deep track, an obscure track, something that I've never heard of. And it's not what I was kind of looking for. Um, and, but if, uh, and of course that's the way they do it. They have licensed, you know, things that maybe, yes, technically they have all those artists, but they're not the kind of tracks that you would expect nor maybe even wish to hear. Um, Apple music, you know, and, and the tears, I mean, the last time I looked and, and this is kind of a free form discussion, so I did not do research on it, but there were multiple tiers that seem to be kind of borderline confusing. And that's one thing about Apple music is you either buy it or you don't. And if you yes. buy it, then you have access to everything, you know, whether you use it, whether you use the radio stations or, you know, the, the programming or the playlists, or you create your own, you still are, are in their, you know, in their, uh, in their ecosystem and Amazon, not quite so much. I don't believe. True. And maybe part of that's the way it evolved. Um, you know, because I think the purpose of some of these other services at Amazon, uh, are to, you know, justify somebody, you know, having a prime service. So to the extent that, you know, streaming, you know, music, you know, or, you know, having their own video and you know, their own video production uh, helps them, you know, get uh, people to uh, renew or to join for the first time uh, prime membership. You know, it's, it's well worth it. One thing that's always intrigued me about the Amazon approach to things, they, they were first out with the, with the smart speaker. Um, and, and it's pretty darn good. You know, excuse me, scratch that. The, the voice recognition, the commands and all that are pretty, pretty darn good. Um, they, but they seem to resist this idea of putting any kind of decent speaker out. Apple, on the other hand, did what Apple does. It created a premium product, um, you know, the, the HomePod, which, you know, they're, yes, they're pricey, but they sound great. But only recently has Amazon itself come out with uh, something that, you know, you would, I, I think you would want to put into your living room if you're any kind of, of anything but a, a very casual listener. Um, you know, the, the original, the original Amazon device and the yes, folks, I'm avoiding saying the words so I don't trigger anything for, for you. Um, okay. It was great, but the sound was, you know, was pathetic. And I just, I, that seemed like such an obvious thing. If you're going to promote music is why wouldn't you do a little bit better on the speaker? Even if you created a couple models, and price them, price them better. I, I just, I've never understood that. I think it drives to strategically what the purpose of uh, the product is. And I think for Amazon, you know, they wanted to make sure that you know they had a better way, you know, to, or were experimenting with easier ways for people to you know buy stuff. You know, they started out, you know, whatever five years, maybe maybe a little bit more, with that uh, little clicker. You know, so you could pre-program it so that if you're running low on laundry detergent or paper towels or dog food or whatever, you could just click it and it would automatically uh, you know, place an order and uh, send it. You know, the subsequent has been replaced by subscription services. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe the uh, the Alexa voice assistant it was maybe conceived of in that uh, that same way. Um, you know, I think also that um, you know all of these companies have to think about you know having and protecting access to their customer base, and you know certainly you know Amazon's Fire Phone you know failed, so you know without that you know they're you know, they've got to be worrisome about you know getting access to you know you know customers who you know use iPhone, uh, you know Google's you know. Google had similar uh, concerns, right? Uh, you know, they were worried that if the Apple, you know, device became, you know, too popular, that, uh, you know, they could get uh, shut out of, uh, you know, premier positions for a search engine. And, you know, that could endanger, you know, their long-term business. So what they do, you know, they, they copied the iPhone and made it uh, open source and uh, released uh, Android upon the world. So I think that, uh, and going back to Amazon, that you know, they're offering these things as ways to get uh, uh, you know, better access. Now, regarding speaker quality, um, I don't know if that was a concern of theirs you know, or not. 
you know, you know, it just, I mean, frankly, I don't know, does Jeff Bezos have good years or does he have, you know, you know, or, or bad years, you know, does he appreciate music? So uh, I think, you know, I think it's probably something like that, you know, it, plus, you know, certainly, you know, having um, quality, you know, music, you know, results intrinsically in a higher price device, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as you said, a lot of these uh, other companies, they seem to be going in a race to the bottom to, you know, have the lowest lowest possible cost and you know for you know for apple's way of thinking that's totally in that play you know, they want to you know they want to build the best product and they once they do that they tend to figure out a price point and they stick to their price points so it's a, it's a different uh, competitive approach i think i think for apple you know the the purpose of you know the you know the home pod speaker was you know, have a better you know, listening uh, quality device to uh, you know increase the sales of uh, you know in subscription rate of uh, Apple Music, uh, and then you know I think adding Siri as a voice assistant was probably a secondary concern. Um, you know, to uh, you know, make it a little bit more useful to uh, do things because you know uh, I think between you know my iPhone and the HomePod, you know the iPhone is you know way smarter. You know, ditto extension, you know, the watch, you know, versus the you know, home pod. I think the watch is much more capable. So, um, uh, you know, we'll have to see what we'll have to see what happens with Apple. Does this go the way of, you know, the airport base station or does it get, uh, you know, updates? I know they've been updating, uh, you know, the uh, firmware for it, but I guess the real test is we'll see a hardware upgrade, you know, which would signal, you know, real commitment uh, to the device. I, I, but I, and I agree with everything you said, but there's one ca- big caveat in there. If the if the HomePod was built as a smart speaker only, I don't think that the microphones in it would have been as good or as prevalent, because the the microphones in in those are just absolutely amazing. I mean, I can be I'm not going to do it here, but I can be t- two rooms away. I'm a room about a room and a half away right now, and if I say her name. She will answer me, and not on my phone in front of me. Most likely, it's going to come from the HomePod. Right. And and if I am if I have the HomePods turned the whole way up to ten, and I'm blasting them, I can still, in a very normal voice, say, "Hey, you know who?" And the music goes away, and she's waiting for me. Whereas in a in a relative in a in a in a room with a TV playing at a normal volume, not blasting, but a normal volume, I still have to shout at the Amazon device. To get its attention, so you know, and, and a relatively recent model of the Amazon device, by the way. So you know, I, I I look at Apple's engineering of the HomePod, and it's like you know, I I, I wish Siri worked just a little better as far as its commands and all that. But we're right back to that old discussion we've had how many times on this show about you know Apple's focus on security and privacy that is a lot greater than some of the other devices and therefore it puts them at a, at a competitive disadvantage. Yeah, I agree with uh, many of those points. Yeah, I would add one more, which is you know, another reason, you know, for the microphones in it is, you know, don't forget that it will uh, sense and adapt you know, to the room acoustics. So, you know, to do that, you know, it will, it, you know, it's a fact it will require, you know, a good set of uh, you know sensitive you know microphones, you know, which they've obviously put to uh, other use through uh, through Siri, you know, which is I think contributes to the overall you know goodness and uh, you know just you know delight factors of uh, you know for me of you know, being an owner and user of that product. Yeah, that's a real good point, and I've I kind of forget about that because you know at least for me once once I place a speaker like that. You know, it, it tunes itself to the room, and it'll tune it every time if I, if I if I move it around. But I've put it where I want it, and that's where it's going to stay. And so I forget about that that aspect of it. Good call. Good call. I'm very pleased to tell you that LinkedIn Jobs is sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. I use LinkedIn for professional reasons, and pretty much every business person I know uses LinkedIn. In fact, anyone who wants to connect with anyone else for business uses LinkedIn. That's why when you need to hire your next great employee, you need to look at LinkedIn Jobs first. LinkedIn Jobs is the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. 
set a daily budget to control your spend or a total budget, and only pay for job post views from prospective applicants, not a fixed fee or an upfront fee. Let LinkedIn screen for not only the technical skills you're looking for, but also for those soft skills that can make your hire the best it can be. Find out why every eight seconds someone is hired from LinkedIn jobs by visiting linkedin.com slash macvoices and take $50 off your first posting. That's linkedinjobs.com to pay what you want and save $50 off your first posting. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks to LinkedIn Jobs for supporting Mac Voices. So there's another one of these, you know, Apple, uh, you know, stories that uh, was in, uh, it was packed away in the trunk and has uh, sprung up again recently. And that's about uh, security. And, uh, you know, the uh, Trump administration, uh, you know, both both the president and, uh, you know, the attorney general seem to be, you know, in the past couple of weeks have you know, made uh, you know, appeals, for, you know, or pushes, you know, to Apple to, uh you know, open up the device in some way. Yeah, and again, I mean, technology people understand that that this is this is truly a black and white issue. That if you open it up for one, you open it up for potentially all, and if you don't open it up, then it's not open. And what's kind of disturbing about the stories as I as I read them, that there are technologies out there that would crack this. They're expensive, they're difficult, they're time-consuming, but you know, they've been able to get into iPhones if they really wanted to. But it just seems like they, the administrations want this to become so much easier. They don't want to want to go through all that cost and expense, and that starts to tramp on you know, your privacy. Now, I don't think you're doing anything nefarious on your phone. I know I'm not. But at the same time, I'm not anxious to have it wide open potentially to anybody that just happens to want to look and see what I've been doing online or you know who I've been communicating with or whatever. Right. So at the end of last week, you know, there were you know, some stories again uh, about the um, uh, the ring doorbell. And remember, before Christmas, there were a number of you know, places where. Hackers had broken in, and uh, you know it. It just you know flocked. You know went all went viral all across uh, all the TV uh, uh, you know, news networks, as well as uh, many many websites. And last Friday, somebody said that oh, this is you know the result because Amazon has a back door in it. Now, strictly speaking, it's not true. I think that I think the systems that were hacked, you know, they either either had, you know, weak passwords or they didn't change them away from the well-known, you know, default passwords. But it occurred to me that, you know, to the extent that that, you know, everyone associate will associate that with the back door, you know, that can create, you know, a simple way for, you know, people to understand why you don't want the government to have a back door into your device. Um, let alone all these security breaches that we've seen from, you know, all the department stores and, uh, you know, the, you know, credit, credit unions and uh, credit card companies, as well as the government, uh, you know, personnel office. Um, fundamentally, if it can be hacked, you know, it, it will be hacked. And um, I, I think that uh, law enforcement has, you know, plenty of tools on its side uh, that it doesn't need encryption. Because don't forget, you know, I still assume that they are listening and you know, logging and analyzing all sorts of uh, metadata. You know, if they're not doing it in real time, certainly with a warrant, they can get it. And, you know, we know AT&T will gladly sell it and provide that information uh, to the government. And with metadata, you can do a lot to figure out uh, how information you know, disperses through a network of people uh, and who's involved in that network. Uh, you know, so I think that can give them a lot of what they need without actually opening the phone and seeing, you know, what did they do, you know, tonight, you know, um, and who they've been speaking to and, you know, what Lord, you know, t- you know, te- text messages they've been sending to, uh, you know, the, you know, their people with whom they're in relationships and, um, yeah, it might make government's job easier, but, um, I suppose as a civil libertarian, I think that, uh, you know, sorry, this is just a bridge you can't cross. You have plenty of tools and plenty of power in other areas. 
And then one other point that I, I always come back to is, okay, fine. Apple opens a back door for you. Do you really think that there are other other places, other countries, other products that are not going to build something that is encrypted that you can't crack? And so if if you buy into the idea that, well, the crooks are using iPhones because they are, you know, much more secure, it's not a big leap to say, okay, if the iPhone becomes insecure, they're going to move on to the next thing. And it, it's or they'll so, move on to the next app. They'll move on to WhatsApp. You know, I mean, yeah. Okay, whatever, you know, make them wide, make the iPhone wide open. If you're using WhatsApp, you know, it's it's encrypted, you know, courtesy of Facebook. You know, so um it, it's a it's a it's a shell game that you know is ultimately is unsolvable. I mean well, unfortunately there are bad people in the world, but you know, all the good people shouldn't have to, you know, suffer uh, you know, it compromises on their privacy, you know, because you know there are bad people out there. And that gets really tough when it's somebody you care about or whatever, you know, or, or that is in peril because of one of these situations or has been harmed because of one of these situations. And it's really difficult, I, I acknowledge, to pull back and look at the bigger picture. But at the end of the day, you know, you just – well – you were talking about breaches and I'm picking on Microsoft again, but it was just a week or two ago that, you know, once again, they had a big security breach, um, you know, and, and it just every, every day you open up the paper and somebody else has had another security breach or I open my email and, you know, this, this website or this service has been hacked or, you know, somebody through human error. And there's another big thing, you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be um, a, a hacker that gets into this, some of this stuff. Sometimes it's just flat out human error or even human stupidity that reveals this stuff. So it just the, the more the, the more security we can have at a common sense, easy to access level, I think the better. And, you know, then, as you said, maybe they have to rely on some other tools that they've had for a while and have been working okay. Maybe that's too simplistic. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's it, it's an emerging, evolving situation. You know, we will see what happens. Um, you know, maybe yeah. we'll, maybe Tim Cook, maybe Tim Apple will call the president and explain the situation and have him cool it and cool down. You know, maybe not. We'll we'll have to see what happens. But uh, again, I think it's. Uh, you know, it's this. This this comes because of Apple's success. Uh, you know, with their you know, popularity of you know their devices. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, I, I feel like we may have come full circle here. That, that Apple is is under this gun because they are at the king, top of the hill when it comes to the phones, and so that's that's the phone everybody wants. That's the phone that a lot of a lot of people are using, and therefore, you know, that's the one that's going to get picked on. Yeah, I mean, I, as far as I know, nobody's mentioned anything about getting into any Samsung phones or, you know, LG phones. It's, it's the iPhone seems to be at the head of the pack. That's the one they want to be able to get into. That's a good question. You know, somebody or a listener you know, should Google that and see if there are incidents like that. Um, you know, certainly you know, I think for a lot of us, it's, you know, it's off on the periphery and something we're you know, just not even paying attention against. But, uh, Again, earning your news from the earnings report: one point five billion active iOS devices. So, of that, I imagine probably ninety percent or eighty, eighty-five percent, you know, are iPhones, and the remainder are you know, iPads. Yeah, you think about that. Um, that is an impressive statistic, and and I forget what the adoption rate of iOS thirteen or iPad OS thirteen was you know extremely high too that was the other thing and yes. so if you, you factor in just that mo that most of those devices but not necessarily all of them could be running 13 that there there are devices out there that, that couldn't be upgraded they're still active on iOS so yeah it's 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 an impressive little juggernaut apple has built here right and people have an I think they've, you know, a lot of you know, the press you know, probably have all adopted. I don't, well, I don't, I wouldn't go that far, but let me say it differently. You know that uh, the uh, relative, you know, size and 
you know, homogeneity of the Apple world in terms of using the latest and greatest iOS and the benefits that brings to developers, uh, we haven't seen or have it contrasted against you know, the fragmentation within the Android world, you know, of the different versions of, you know, the Android OS that you know, all the different phone makers you know, and carriers have you know, out there in, uh, in the market. Yeah. Mark, I don't know if we've solved anything, but it's been an interesting discussion. Um, I'm kind of anxious to see what what the coming weeks bring, uh, both good and bad, uh, it, with the China situation, and um, and see what Apple does with about new products this year, because we are heading into that that first quarter that is not the holiday quarter, and as if memory serves, that's traditionally Apple's weakest, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what what comes out of that one. Yeah, the Q1 calendar quarter or apple's q2 fiscal quarter is definitely the low because you go from a high level of holiday sales you know everything drops off um but if you look at you know three and four after that you know you sort of establish a, a new level and foundation for you know where things are going to be growing from into the following fiscal year and um you know we'll see i think you know barring any disaster uh due to uh, the end coronavirus, uh, I, I think um, it seems overall the stock market is happy and wants to go up. And uh, we'll have to see. I think Apple will continue with that. I mean, it seemed to point in November and December. It seems like every day Apple was at a brand new high. So, um, you know, it, uh, it it drove up. And I think, again, that was you know sign of the overall market was going up. Plus, you know, I think, uh, you know, large institutions and investors were changing their appreciation and understanding of Apple. Because if you look at it, you know, if you look last quarter, you know, $20 billion of cash. And uh, Luca continues to say, uh, said again, this, uh, this last earnings call that, you know, they want to migrate to a, you know, cash neutral position, meaning, you know, they return the cash, you know, to their shareholders. Um, they've been continuing to buy back shares uh, you know, shares are decreasing about, uh, you know, 8% per year, number of shares outstanding. Um, that's from memory. So it's, uh, it's in the range, but certainly going to be wrong. It's not going to be, you know, 8%, you know, hit on. Um, they've been returning each quarter about 15% in terms of uh, dividends to their shareholders. So, uh, you know, this is, you know, I think creates the fundamentals for, you know, continued uh, share price appreciation. Um, which again is an artifact of you know, having uh, products and you know services that uh, that people like. Um, Chuck, I know you were at CES. Uh, question for you: uh, Did you pay much attention to any of the noise around five G? And you know, do you have an opinion on you know will that be a driver, or is that just uh, is that just noise in the headlines uh, right now? Um, yeah, Mark, 5G f- figure prominently in, in the discussions, especially at the, uh, at, at the, pre- the CES preview, um, how this is going to change things. And I know I was listening today to, you know, will the, the next iPhone be 5G or not? Um, and and the, the last night at the Super Bowl, you know, there was a lot of talk over, you know, this is the, these were some of the first 5G broadcasts. Um, and 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 for, I'm, I'm I'm getting to where you want me to go, uh, but there was an, also an article today, and I forgive me, folks, I don't remember exactly where it was, but you can find it, where last night's 4K broadcast was not really 4K, it was 1080p upscaled to 4K, um, and one of the big issues with doing 4K is the bandwidth issues, and so until we get something like 5G deployed a lot more widely, you know, there's there's a limit as to how much data can be can be pushed out. Um, you know, as usual, I think there's a lot of hype over it, and there certainly was a lot of hype at CES. But at the same time, I think there's there's some reality mixed in there too, that if you get more bandwidth, you can do a lot more things that maybe we didn't know we could do or wanted to do or needed to do. I mean, think about uh, about HD versus uh, standard definition. Mm-hmm. And, you know, think about the horsepower you have in the chips in your computers now and in your phones that you, you before you, you couldn't do voice recognition, you couldn't do dictation, you couldn't do any of that. Now you have the processing power and those things become commonplace. 
So I think it's a matter of, you know, how quickly can, can and will the carriers get this stuff rolled out? Um, and, you know, will that, what, what does that mean? You know, as, as far as Apple, does Apple really need to have a 5G phone this time around? And, and note I said a 5G phone, not the whole line. Um, you know, maybe they bring out something that for those early adopters that really feel like they want it or need it and then let it, you know, come into the line later when things get a bit more mainstream. Um, so, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think it's coming. I think it will be important, but I don't think it's going to be like flipping the light switch that, oh my God, you know, I have to have 5G because uh, there are going to be just a lot of things that don't support it or it doesn't make sense for just yet. Does that answer the question? <laughs> It, it does. I I agree with um, I agree with you, but I would I would underscore you know, a number of your points as I think being you know particularly important, and that is with regards to how quickly it rolls out, uh, because you know, as a technology, you know we know what it's capable of. Uh, I, I think the carriers are probably a little guilty of overhyping you know, the benefits of the high speed uh, you know five G capability aspects. But that requires a very dense, you know, so-called millimeter wave, uh, you know, you know, cell uh, deployments, and there's going to be a hell of a lot of them, and you know, that's going to be expensive. You know, there's I think more a step back from that of you know deploying 5G equipment that uses 5G protocols over existing uh, frequencies. Um, and there, depending on where you are and what your carrier has done, you may see same speeds or, you know, a little bit or significant you know, speed increase. But, you know, I, I'm very cautious of uh, all of these claims about you know, how fast it's going to be and how everything will go wireless and we're not going to need you know, wired Internet of some sort, you know, into our home. Because uh, I think that is just way, 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 way overhyping it. Um and it seems to me now it is more of a marketing uh, expense, if you will, you know, for for the carriers, you know, to motivate you know people, you know, either to maintain their current customer base or or for churn to you know, steal customers away from you know from each other, ATT from Verizon or T-Mobile or T-Mobile from whoever you know, you get the idea, um, and. Yeah, I think we'll see what happens. And you certainly, I think a lot of phone makers and they're pushing, Samsung is certainly pushing, you know, 5G. Uh, I don't think Apple is behind, you know, because again, you know, one of the other, one of the other Apple myths, you know, in that, uh, you know, in that filing cabinet that we talk about, you know, this time a year ago, everyone was saying, oh, Apple, you know, the world is, you know, it's, it's going to be a world of hurt with their iPhone if they don't have 5G on it. Well, you know, had they done that, they would have been way ahead of the market. And that's not typically what Apple you know, does in terms of its products. So, you know, this year we'll see if all of them, you know, there's some talk that all the devices will have 5G. There's some talk that only no, maybe different selected devices will have it. Um, you know, that's a product portfolio you know, management uh, you know, discussion and, um you know, there's no better people you know involved you know, to do that than Apple. You know, the rest of us are just armchair philosophers. You know, taking a look at uh, you know, what we think might or might not do. So, uh, certainly, I'm not going to say Apple must do this because then I have to not listen to myself. Like I don't you know, read any of those uh, you know headlines or you know blog posts that say Apple must do. You know, because. Uh, uh, we can quibble on the you know, decisions and trade-offs that we make, but you know they have all the information, and the rest of us just have opinions. That's that's well said. We should put that on a T-shirt. Apple <laughs> has all the information. We just have opinions. Yeah, I like that. I like that. No, I I agree with you. I I think you know that it it's just everybody is hungry for you know the next thing that will change their lives. And in fact, I heard uh, oh shoot. I can't remember now. Some, one a commentator say, you know, well, we're still waiting for Apple to come out with, you know, the next thing that will will change our lives. And it's like, well, yeah, they've done this how many times, and you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but there's no timetable for this stuff. And yet, there's 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 an appetite for something that they don't even know what it is. They just want it to come and change their lives, and I don't quite understand that. You know, I, I'm 
if if you could tell me what magic product would you like Apple to make outside of a transporter, I don't know what's next. You know, but somebody's thinking about it. How about an Apple bicycle? You know, you can you know track your activity. You know, it will link to your watch, which will link to your phone, which will link to your iPad and link to your Mac, so you can you know track all your activity. And overall, I think that will be a you know boon for you know people's health. You know, all across uh, across the U.S. So um, that's what I would that's what I would bet on is an Apple bicycle. Okay, sounds good. We'll call Tim Cook and tell him to get right on that. <laughs> Mark, where can folks find you when you're not here um, pedaling your bicycle? Sorry, couldn't help it. <laughs> uh, best place is Twitter at Mark Fuccio, M A R K F U C C I O, or via LinkedIn. Great. Mark, thanks for the time. Always good to see you, and it's always fun to have these discussions. This was, you know, this was, you know, sorry, this was a nice discussion. It had a, you know, uh, announced topic and uh, no specific agenda. So we covered a lot of ground here and it was yeah. a lot of fun talking with you. Agreed. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. I hope you enjoyed this too. Um, Mark and I like to get together once in a while and do this kind of thing. And sometimes it's it's fun to do it on camera and let you share, share in it. Uh, neither one of us necessarily have the answers, but we have a lot of questions and it's fun to talk about. Until the next time, and as always, Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.